on our YouTube channel. Now, my next guest is a leading scholar and foreign policy expert at the Hudson Institute. He's a professor at Bard College and columnist for the Wall Street Journal. I began by asking Walter Russell Mead about Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney's first 100 days in power and whether she's proved her often hysterical critics wrong. She is right now the most popular single leader in the European Union. Wow. She has a 52% approval rate and none of the others are, are close to that. I think the hysteria was a little overblown. Italy needs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. The European Union is the only place it's going to come from. She's a very intelligent woman. She Absolutely. is not going to start time in office with a fight with the European Union that results in Italy's budget being cut in various ways. So she's, she's off to a good start. But she's not shy about holding others to account, uh, particularly when it comes to France, because Macron has been a critic of her and uh, in the past she's just laid out what France is doing, what it's doing in Africa, the, the harm that country causes and, and, uh, and the waves of illegal immigration that she says are connected to some of those harms. Well, that's right. And it's true that if you look at French policy, it has not been very Italy friendly. Yeah. And, you know, they've made a lot of promises for it because Italy has a, that huge, long coastline getting so close to Africa. That's where a lot of the refugees just naturally come. Mm -hmm. And Italy would very much like other European countries either to do something to stop the flow of refugees across the water, or if they won't do that, have some system for allocating the refugees mm -hmm. so that Italy doesn't end up taking everyone while the others lecture Italy for, for being too anti-refugee. Yeah. And France has not been cooperative on either of those two agendas. Now, the United States remains Asia's most powerful country, followed by China, which has had its strength eroded by strict COVID-19 lockdowns and border closures. That's the assessment of the Lowy Institute, their latest findings. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Do you, do you think that's still the status quo? I do. I think... Um, I mean, certainly the United States is number one, China's number two, I think Japan is number three. I don't think any of those rankings are controversial. Mm. But I do think what is amazing is that China has so alarmed and alienated its neighbors that, you know, as an American, you don't expect when you go to Vietnam, people saying, we want to see more of you. Mm. Please send more Americans to Vietnam. <laughs> uh, for someone of my age who remembers the Vietnam War, this is a big surprise. But Japan is doubling its expense, defense spending. The Philippines is welcoming the U.S. to use four new bases. The Quad gets stronger every day. India is clearly much more concerned than it used to be. And all of this is down to China. But is that partly due because there's this belief that they're going to move on Taiwan, that that's become almost inev inevitable? Well, we know that they want to. Mm. And I think it's reasonable to say that if they could treat Taiwan the way they treated Hong Kong, they, they wouldn't take them t 10 minutes mm. to decide to do it. So the question is whether they think it will, an attack would succeed. And at least on the American side, as we look at it, uh, the war games and other things, it's not clear whether who would win. Now, from the American point of view, that's terrible because yeah. we, it should be clear. Yeah. It should be clear. But from the Chinese point of view, that's a big risk to take mm. because Xi Jinping is sitting now in Beijing. He really faces no serious opposition. Uh, if he started a war for Taiwan and lost, that would be a huge disgrace. I mean, one wonders even if the Communist Party could survive a mm. defeat. So he's not going to do it unless he's pretty sure. Now, you're the author of the forthcoming book, The Ark of a Convent, The United States, Israel and the Fate of the Jewish People. So I want to ask you about uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Firstly, uh, he is facing all sorts of uh, criticism, tremendous criticism, particularly coming from the US and the left in the US. Uh, how do you see his next reign? I've met with Bibi a number of times over the years. Uh, I think he is... I think he is probably, certainly, the greatest living Israeli politician. 
and you look at what Israel has accomplished during his previous stints in office, mm -hmm. and it's been substantial. Think about how around the world now people think of Israel as a cyber power. Mm -hmm. That didn't just happen. Israel didn't move to the front of the tech ranks globally and attract huge amounts of global tech investment out of nothing. Those were policy choices that Netanyahu governments put into place and then kept going. Look at the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. What Israeli leader in history has signed as many agreements with as many Arab states as, as Bibi has done? So, and then, you know, when Bibi calls Putin or when he calls Biden or when he calls any world leader, people take the call. And he has a certain level of personal respect internationally it's, again, it, I don't think there's any Israeli in his class. Walter Russell made fascinating insights. Thank you so much for joining me tonight.